Virtual heritage is a new field studying ways of applying new 3D technologies to research and instruction in fields such as anthropology, art and architectural history, and conservation science. Professor Frischer has been a leading figure in the field overseeing many 3D modeling projects, including Rome Reborn, the digital recreation of the entire city of ancient Rome within the Aurelian walls about which he will be speaking this evening. In 2004, he created the first 3D digital reconstructions of an ancient statue, the lost portrait of the philosopher Epicurus. His widely praised digital Hadrian's Villa resulted from a collaboration among more than a dozen museums, scores of scholars, and several research and design centers, including Ball State Institute for Digital Intermedia Art under John Philbaugh's leadership. The Digital Scholarship Lecture represents an invitation to students, faculty, and staff, and the public to think more deeply about the challenges and opportunities presented by the proliferation of digital technologies used for research and scholarly communication. Among the cutting edge tools to emerge over the past decade is virtual reality. We often associate VR with computer games, but it is also a powerful platform for teaching, learning, and research. Nobody is better equipped to help us understand how virtual reality can be employed for scholarly purposes than our guest this evening. Bernard Fisher. Well, the Rome Reborn Project is an initiative launched back in 1996, which we thought at that time was going to be a two-year project, by the way, to create a 3D reconstruction of ancient Rome in the year 320 AD, shortly before the capital of the empire was moved to Constantinople. This year was chosen because it represents the peak of the urban development of the ancient city. The reconstruction did not take two years to complete, but 22 years, and of course, as a digital uh, creation, it's really never complete, but last summer, uh, we declared it completed. Uh, and during those 22 years, it went through three distinct versions. The first two versions were developed in the period of 1996 to 2007 under the auspices and with the copyright of the regents of the University of California. And you will recall from what the provost told you that the project started when I was a professor at UCLA, so this is not surprising. But in 2004, I moved to the University of Virginia, so further collaboration with uh, California was not as uh, easy as it had been. And the latest version was created from 2008 to 18 with completely new content by my company, Frischer Consulting. And this version is called Rome Reborn version 3.0. In August of last year, applications for PC, uh, PCs and laptops, as well as VR headsets using version 3.0 of the model was made available. Now, thanks to the availability of the interactive urban model, we can look at the city in a more holistic and dynamic way. Like all new scientific instruments, Rome Reborn allows us to make observations and to run experiments that in the case of a historical discipline such as Roman archaeology would have been impossible without true time travel. Humphrey's book is relevant for my talk today because it makes a strong case for viewing a computer simulation such as Rome Reborn as a valid epistemic enhancer. In the publication you see on the screen, uh, which Professor Philwark, by the way, uh, contributed to, as you see, uh, I, coined the point that I coined the term sympiricism for this kind of enhancer. That is a portmanteau word combining simulation and empiricism. And I'm happy to report that Humphreys, whom I know personally, likes and is starting to use the new word. <laughs> a final piece of background to my talk concerns virtual heritage, or VH for short. VH is a new field that typically starts by digitizing the 3D cultural heritage object of interest and then shows how through visualization techniques we can advance our understanding of it. If we want to take a VH approach to the vanished city of ancient Rome in the spirit of the methodological program I have been sketching, before we can use digital means to visualize our object of study and try to see something new in it, we must first recreate it by means of one of 
Humphrey's epistemic enhancers. In our case, this means a digital urban model. With this background in mind, we can now proceed to our three case studies. The first deals with the nature of the alignment between the Arapacus and the Montecitorio obelisk, seen from a fixed position. The second asks why the Emperor Constantius II chose to view the Roman Forum from the Augustan Rostra when he visited Rome for the first time in 357 AD. And the third shows how land use in the city as a whole was dictated more by environmental constraints than by a preconceived geometry. The altar is the single best preserved artistic monument uh, surviving from Augustan Rome. The obelisk, which as you see still exists, was brought by the emperor from Heliopolis near modern Cairo to Rome during the same period in which the altar was being sculpted. Augustus's reason in investing substantial resources to transport the obelisk all the way to Rome from Egypt has long interested scholars. This question can serve as my case study today because the two co-authored articles my team recently published on it made heavy use of a computer simulation of this part of Augustine Rome. And as I pointed out, uh, Professor Philwock was a co-author of the first article, which you already saw on the, on the slide, and also of the second article. And that computer simulation was made by the IDEA lab, by his lab here at Ball State. It turned out that once we resurveyed the monuments, did a new quarrying through the pavement discovered by Buchner in 1980 and poured over his unpublished documents in the German Archaeological Institute in Munich, we were able to show in this article that Buchner's visualization is a case in point of the kind of error that Humphreys in discussing computer simulations warned us against. So he already had the theory when he'd done the field work and it was in the 1976 article before he had new facts that he might have illustrated that he made this illustration. So it's a good case in point of the dangers with simulations of any kind, whether traditional uh, static 2D drawings like this, or dynamic 3D of the kind that we use, the danger of a priori knowledge. Buchner had the idea that the shadow went into the altar on the emperor's birthday even before he did his excavation that found a part of the monument. When he dug and found something real, it actually contradicted his original theory, so he adjusted the theory by hypothesizing, and tried to save the theory, by hypothesizing two phases of the monument. What he found was in the wrong place by just a relatively small amount. Only new archival research, geological quarry, and a computer simulation could have shown the error of Buchner's approach and results. But the simulation did more than help us to refute Buchner's theory. Using the simulation for several years as an instrument supporting virtual observation, we were able to show that the shadow did in fact reach the interior of the altar on 48 days of the year. We wrote up our results in a second article, proposing a new post Buchnerian interpretation of the alignment. We suggested that these sun and shadow effects were ways that the emperor and his designers evoked a sense of religious awe appropriate to the worship of the sun god. Now let me pass to my second case study, which operates at the medium scale of the city center. We know that the emperor Constantius II visited Rome for the first time in his life in 357 AD. In a well-known passage, the historian Ammianus Marcellinus describes Constantius II's visit, which involved a lot of sightseeing. Here is a segment that is most relevant for our purposes. So then, when Constantius II entered Rome and when he had come to the rostra, he stood amazed, and on every side on which his eyes rested, he was dazzled by the crowding together of marvelous sights. So from Ammianus' account, we learn that the very first site in Rome visited by the emperor was the Roman Forum, the city center, and that in the Forum, his first stop was the Rostra, the old speaker's platform. That Constantius II began his tour of the Forum up on the Augustan Rostra is not, I, I dare say, an accident. This must have been the normal place for the local tour guides to bring out-of-towners visiting the city for the first time. The reuse of the old Augustan Rostra for tourism may partially explain why it was respected through the centuries, even long after it had ceased to have its original function of giving Republican politicians who wanted to address an assembly of the people a good place to stand and be heard by their fellow citizens. Assemblies of the people ceased to be held 
in the reign of that very first emperor, Augustus. How a city model such as Rome Reborn can support new scholarship by making it possible to re-experience a nearly vanished space such as the Roman Forum, to move around it at a normal eye level, and to notice features that, as the long record of scholarship on the Forum attests, would never occur to anyone absent this new tool of discovery. It can also bring to life the ancient historical records, as we were able to do with Ammianus' account of the detail about how Constantius started his forum tour by mounting the rostra, a detail on which no commentator on the text of Ammianus has ever commented. Now let's turn to our third case study where the scale is the biggest of all. This study concerns the question of land use and spatial organization in late antique Rome. Here is where a city model such as Rome Reborn really comes into, into its own, and by letting us fly like a bird all over the city, it gets our brain's visualization cognition circuits firing in new, and I hope you will agree, fruitful ways. Before I sketch out some of the observations I have to offer you, let me note that in the scholarship there are two diametrically opposed views about the spatial organization of ancient Rome. The commonplace view is that Rome grew haphazardly like Topsy, and unlike its hundreds of colonies around the empire, cities like London and Paris, and uh, you name it, there are hundreds of them, it did not have a geometric plan, and certainly not two main streets, east, west, and north, south, crossing uh, in the middle at the main town square. As Ferdinando Castagnoli put it in his authoritative book on the topography and urbanistics of ancient Rome, Regarding the regularity of urban structure, which is a characteristic of the Greek and Roman world, it is completely absent from Rome. And most scholars have seen two patterns of intervention by individual leaders or by imperial dynasties. On the one hand, a few emperors like Augustus, Domitian, and Adrian built their prestige project scattershot all over the city, leaving their mark wherever they could, but leaving the street pattern as chaotic as they had originally found it. On the other hand, most emperors concentrated their energies in a fairly limited area and just built that one limited area up and or restored the buildings in it. For the record, there's a second view. I refer to the idea first proposed by the great professor of Roman topography at the Sapienza University, Rodolfo Lanciani, and uh, later by another professor at the Sapienza University, urban planner Pierre Maria Lully. According to these two scholars, there was a hidden geometry seen in this slide dictating the layout not of the streets of Rome, but at least of the major monuments. Once we have the city model and can fly around overhead as much as we like and go wherever we like, we start to see not a hidden geometry and certainly not an orthogonal layout that everybody else has missed. Instead, we see something else, the need to shift the terms of order from geometric to organic form. The lack of geometry is actually not at all surprising, since urban planners today tell us that a grid plan is typically found for one of two reasons, or possibly for both of two reasons. First, to ensure the equitable distribution of land when a city is newly founded, or a part of a city is newly laid out. Secondly, to help facilitate the flow of traffic. Neither reason applies to Imperial Rome. So instead of looking for some principle of geometric organization, we can attend to what our visualization is really suggesting, I think, that the Roman use of space conformed in a very organic way to the realities of topography, economy, and environment. As I explored the city model, what started to emerge as the ordering principle was a clustering by topographical categories such as hilltop, hillside, valley floor, and riverbank, and a related clustering by building type such as public bath, recreational facility, temple, private house, and tenement. In conclusion, we are not forced between, to choose between seeing a hidden esoteric geometry or a puzzling and even lamentable lack of geometry when we consider the use of space in ancient Rome. Be that as it may, I hope that you will at the very least agree that my views, however correct or mistaken that you may consider them, would never have arisen had I not been able to fly many times over the ancient city and try to grasp the significance of what I was seeing. Rudolf Arnheim would not have been at all surprised that my new visual sensations have resulted in some new thoughts. 
And in the end, that is my main point in this talk. The 3D urban models, such as Rome Reborn, can open up new vistas in the empirical, or better, sympirical study of ancient cityscapes. I hope my case studies have also shown that, as a visualization, Rome Reborn is not only a new tool that teachers, I hope, will find helpful, and some already are in a number of, of schools and, and universities, but also one that scholars will be able to deploy in several of the useful ways Colin Ware showed are common to many scientific visualizations, including those produced uh, by the new field of virtual heritage.